Hey guys, um, I just wanted to pick up where we left off in class on Tuesday. So if you remember, we were on page 85 in your workbook and we had just started doing multi-step inequalities. Um, and again, just a reminder, we said we knew that we were going to graph these on a number line instead of an xy plane because there was only one variable. When we used the x and the y together, it was because there was, instead of having a 3 here, for example, there would have been a y is less than, or, uh, is less than negative 5n plus 2n or something like that. All right, so we're graphing all these on uh, number lines. We had already done problems 2 and 4, and I said that for the most part, solving uh, inequalities is exactly the same as solving equations with the exception of one time and we did not get a chance to look at that one case so that's what we're going to look at today and we're also going to look at things how can we make them a little bit more complicated than what we saw on Tuesday so let's take a look at problem number one so <clears throat> I kind of covered up the three there uh, for problem number one, we would just do what we think we should do, all right? On the right side, we can combine like terms, and so we would say that 3 is less than negative 3n. All right, if we were to continue like we normally do, we would think, okay, let me divide both sides by negative 3, and then we would get negative 1 is less than n. All right, but I want to see you, I want you to see that there is an error in what we just did here. Again, in this side, it was fine to divide both sides by 12. That's what we did right here. We got the correct answer. Uh, in fact, I believe we even tried a couple in there to make sure that it was true. Um, but I just want you to see that here it's going to be wrong. So let's pick an n that's greater than negative 1. Like, and again, let me write this so that the n is on the left side, which is, at least in my opinion, the more preferable side. Um, so let's pick an n that's greater than negative 1, and it should work in here. All right, so I'm going to say let's pick 0 and see what happens. So if we try that out, is 3 less than negative 5 times 0 plus 2 times 0? In other words, is 3 less than 0? And the answer we get is no. If I try an n greater than negative 1, specifically say 0, I do not get a true uh, statement here. And again, I'm going back to the original when I when I do this. So I get something that's false. And the reason that that happened is because we divided by a negative number. Again, negatives make things kind of go in the opposite direction that you would think they would. So when we divided both sides by a negative right here, uh, we, we should have flipped that inequality sign because again, that just kind of makes things go in reverse. So the rule, the one exception that I was mentioning to you, we just found it right here. Whenever we divide or multiply by a negative number, we must cross out the inequality and reverse it in the next step. As soon as we divide by a negative sign, that inequality sign is no longer correct and we need to reverse it to the opposite direction. All right. So now this is saying, no, instead of choosing values that are greater than negative 1, we have to choose values that are less than negative 1. So again, let me try it out just to verify to you that it actually works. So this was bad. That was not true. But let's say we pick negative 2. All right, so is 3 less than negative 5 times negative 2 plus 2 times negative 2? Right, negative 5 times 2, negative 2 is 10, so is 3 less than 10 plus a negative 4 or minus 4? In other words, is 3 less than 6? And yes, that is true. All right, so when we reverse the inequality sign, we, when we divide or multiply by a negative number, the solution set that we get is correct. All right, so again here, how would we graph it? Well, the fact that we have strictly less than means that we're going to put a hollow dot at negative 1. And then we're going to shade every all n values that are less than negative 1, which means we're going to shade on to the, uh, to the left here on this side right here. And you can try again, keep picking different values, put negative 5 in, make sure that when you put it in there that, it's, um, that 3 is less than that, but it will always work. All right, as long as we remember, when you divide or multiply by a negative number, you must reverse the inequality. That is not true if we're adding or subtracting. We can add or subtract negative numbers all we want. The inequality stays the same. Just dividing or multiplying by a negative, we have to reverse it. All right, let's look at problem number three. 
All right, for problem number three, again, we would start out the same way that we did in problem number one, combine like terms. So this is negative 5p is greater than negative 10. All right, I divide both sides by negative 5. And again, as soon as I divide or multiply by a negative number, cross out that inequality sign because it's no longer true. So this now says that p is less than 2. All right, let's check it out. So let's pick a value for p that's less than 2. Wow, this is messed up the way they drew it here. They didn't give us very much room. Let's try 1, or better yet, let's try 0. So if I do negative 0 minus 4 times 0, is that greater than negative 10? Well, this just gives me 0. Is 0 greater than negative 10? Yes, it is. So we know that this is the correct side. And again, we're going to put a mark of some sort at 2. Since this is strictly less than, we're going to make it a hollow dot. And then shade the less than. All right. Let's try number five. All right, again, combine like terms. Nine is greater than or equal to negative two m minus one. I'm gonna add one to both sides. Again, that's what I would do if I were solving an equality instead of an inequality. So this would become 10 is greater than negative two m, sorry, greater than or equal to negative two m. I divide both sides by a negative 2. As soon as I do that, I have to cross out the inequality. It's no longer true. This becomes negative 5 is less than or equal to m. Again, we could write that with the m first. m is greater than or equal to negative 5. All right, so let's pick a value that's greater than or equal to negative 5. Like, let's say 0 again and just try it is 9 greater than or equal to negative 2 times 0 plus 2 minus 3. In other words, is 9 greater than or equal to, that just gives us 0 plus 2 minus 3 gives us negative 1. Is 9 greater than or equal to negative 1? Yes. So we are correct that we want values greater than or equal to negative 5. Again, since we have that greater than or equal to, now it's a solid dot at negative 5 and I want to pick everything bigger than negative 5. Okay, let's take a look at number 6. All right, what do you think you should do first? Hopefully you said you should distribute the negative 6, so this would become negative 24x minus 36 is greater than negative 11. Sorry, I just wrote that. I didn't say it. So altogether, negative 3 minus 24x minus 36 is greater than negative 111. All right, combine like terms. So negative 24x minus 39 is greater than negative 111. I'm going to add 39 to both sides. I get negative 24x is greater than, uh, should be negative 72. Yeah, 72. All right, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 24. Let me write this up here again. Negative 24x is greater than negative 72. Divide both sides by negative 24. Again, immediately cross out that inequality sign because it's no longer true. And I end up with x is less than, and then uh, 24 goes into 72 three times. Okay, and again, you can try a point uh, I'm going to pick 0 again because 0 is less than 3. If I put 0 in here, I get negative 3 minus 6 times, that would be 0 plus 6, so just 6. Is that greater than negative 111? Negative 6 times 6 is negative 39, so negative 3 minus 39 is going to give me negative 42. Is that greater than negative 111? Yes, it is. So I definitely want to pick values of x less than 3. Since it's strictly less than, hollow dot on 3, shade everything to the left. 
again, I wrote this note up at the top. I'm not sure if you saw it or not, but if it's not equality, uh, so strictly less than, strictly greater than, it's a hollow dot. And if there is equality, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, it should be a solid dot. Right? Sorry, I hope I didn't move that away too quickly for you there for number six. Okay, next page, page 86. I only want to look at problems 21 and 22 because they are very special. Okay, we're just going to do 21 and 22 just the way we have been doing, but uh, something unusual happens. So this side, I'm going to get negative 6 minus 42k plus 7 plus 42k is less than or equal to negative 2. I combine like terms and realize that the terms with the variables cancel out. So I end up with 1 is less than or equal to negative 2. Again, moment of panic steps in because you did not intend to cancel those variables out. It just happens. Right, and I want you to think back to when we were doing systems of equations because things like this happened to us then too where sometimes we accidentally canceled out both variables in our systems of equations. And if you remember, we had things like we would end up with either something like 0 equals 0 or 0 equals 6. Those were the two different cases that we would see. And so what I told you then when we were doing this is you should ask yourself the question, when is 0 equal to 0? When is that true? Well, 0 is always equal to 0. And so in that case, when we were doing systems, it meant that the lines always intersected because they were the same line. It was like one line, and then we drew the other one on top. So when does 0 equal 0? Always. When do the lines intersect? Always. For 0 equals 6, we would say, when is 0 equal to 6? Never. When did the lines intersect? Never. They were parallel lines. Right. It's the same kind of thing here. We're going to ask is or when is 1 less than or equal to negative 2? Never. So when can we find solutions to this inequality? Never. We would say this is never true, so there is no k that's going to make this inequality true. So we would say there are no solutions. All right. It just doesn't work. <clears throat> in problem 22, something similar will happen. Um, we've got negative 2 times 2 is negative 4 plus 4x. We distribute the negative 4 here. We get minus 4x minus 20. Is that less than or equal to, or when is that less than or equal to 24, negative 24? Here, these cancel out, and I get negative 24 is less than or equal to negative 24. Right. Is that true? Is negative 24 less than or equal to negative 24? Yes. It did not depend on what x value we put in there. This is always true. All right. x, uh, negative 24 is always less than or equal to negative 24. And so we would say uh, all real numbers is our solution. Everything works because any x that we put in here is always going to result in this, which is always true. All right, so any x that we put in is going to make this work. So this we would just shade the entire number line. All right, now I want to point out that if this had changed, if this instead of uh, less than or equal to was strictly less than, so we ended up with 24 is less than 24, this would be the same as this one, no solutions. When is 24 less than 24? I'm sorry, negative 24 less than negative 24? Never. Negative 24 is never less than itself. It could be equal to itself, but it's never less than itself. So if it had been this right here, instead of less than or equal, if it had been strictly less than, this would be no solutions. Right? The only thing that saved us was the fact that there was less than or equal to. Right? 
in problems 23 and 24, you're going to see the same situation. So I just want you to remember, if you get an untrue inequality, uh, so if you get, uh, if you lose your variables, and end up with an untrue inequality, you get no solutions. So there's nothing that you're going to shade on the number line because there are no solutions to this. All right. If you end up with with a true inequality, then that means all real numbers are your solution, and then you shade the entire number line. And again, be careful for something like this. This is kind of an unusual case in that these are equal to each other. Um, so if it's less than or equal, this is true, but if it's strictly less than, it's false. Hopefully, you'll end up with a situation like this. Um, not necessarily that it's wrong, but the fact that we have two different numbers. It would be easier to tell in this case if it was, let's say, um, 19 is less than or equal to 25. That is more obvious. This is such a subtlety that it can be a little bit tricky. So hopefully you don't run into that, but more something like that. Okay. Hopefully you're feeling all right right now. All right, so the next set of problems that we're going to work on are on page 79 and 80. Pages 79 and 80 on excluded values. All right, looks like this. 79 and 80. Okay. Excluded values, uh, so remember we've been talking about the domain of a function, what values the function takes on. Um, I'm sorry, what values you're allowed to plug into the function. And we can tell that by a graph sometimes. If we have one, but a lot of times we're not going to get a graph. And so we have to tell from the function when we're allowed to plug in a value and when we're not. If you remember last year we talked about extraneous solutions. And those arose when we were doing rational equations like this, solving rational equations, or when we are solving radical equations. We're just going to look at excluded values in um, rational expressions. So what values, if we got them as our solution, would we have to say, no, this was extraneous, right? And again, if you remember our conversation, we said, well, the only problem that could happen is if we ended up with a zero in the denominator somehow. Right? Whatever value made that zero, we would have to say that is an excluded value. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, when is 6n minus 2, the denominator, equal to zero? So we can say, you may not join our function. Right? You are not part of our domain. Well, let's just solve this and see what we get. So I get 6n equals 2. And then I divide both sides by 6, and I get n equals 2 sixths or 1 third. All right, so we would say the excluded value is 1 third. Okay, for problem number four. Again, as soon as I see a fraction, I want to know, is there anything that I'm not allowed to plug into this function because it's going to make the denominator equal to zero? Well, I would say, same thing, let me set the denominator equal to zero. Well, hopefully you realize how silly that is. 63 is never going to be equal to zero. So again, it's because there's no variable down here. If we have a constant like that, the constant is never going to suddenly become zero. Right, And so we would say, well, if there's a constant in the denominator, that's not going to produce any excluded values. So this just doesn't make sense, and we would say no excluded values. Okay, for number six. Right, 
Let's look at this one. Number 6. 14x squared minus 16x. Again, notice that we're never paying attention to the numerators. We don't care. The numerator is allowed to be 0, so we're just ignoring that. Um, it's just the denominator that we have a problem with that we don't want it to equal 0. So we are going to say, hey, when are you 0? And then we're going to exclude you. All right, so hopefully this brings back lovely memories of last year when we were factoring. So I'm going to say, how can I factor this equation? Well, our choices are GCF, difference of squares, easy general trinomial, ardor general trinomial, or grouping. All right, hopefully you recognize that as a GCF. So take just a second to factor out what you believe is the greatest common factor. All right, I'm going to take out a 2x, so that leaves me with 7x minus 8 equals 0. All right, now I have a product of two things equaling 0, so either 2x equals 0 or 7x minus 8 equals 0. If it's the former, 2x equals 0, I divide both sides by 2, and I get x equals 0. And on this one, I'm going to add 8 to both sides, so I get 7x equals 8, and then divide both sides by 7, so x equals 8 sevenths. All right, so our excluded values are... x equals 0 and x equals 8 sevenths. All right, so again, notice how we just had 1 up here, but now we have 2. This is because in this first problem, the highest exponent is 1, so we only have one solution that's going to make this equal to 0, versus here we had an exponent of 2, so we should have two solutions that make it equal to 0. Okay, let's jump to the next page, page 80. And we're just going to look at problems 16 and 26 on this side. All right, so for problem 16, again, ignore the numerator. It doesn't matter when this is 0. That's totally fine. It's just the denominator that we are concerned about. So we've got x squared plus 5x minus 14, and we want to know when is that equal to 0 so we can exclude you. All right, what do you think we should do with this? All right, hopefully you said, let's factor it. I'm looking for two things that multiply to 14 that subtract to 5. So that should be an x and a 7 and an x and a 2. I want that to turn out to be positive 5, so I need the larger one to be positive and the smaller one to be negative. All right, so this tells me that x equals negative 7, and this tells me that x equals 2. Therefore, these are our two excluded values. So excluded values are x equals negative 7 and x equals 2. All right, and then the last one that we're going to do on this page is number 26. I just picked that one because it just kind of looks nasty. All right, so again, we're going to take 3a squared, nope, 3a cubed minus 3a squared minus 18a and set it equal to 0. Again, that being a cubed means you should be expecting three excluded values this time. All right. Hopefully you notice that there's a 3a in each of these, so let's factor that out. I'm going to end up with a squared minus a minus 6 equals 0. This is still factorable. That's an easy general trinomial. So we've got 3a, and then this is going to be a minus 3, a plus 2. I was looking for two things that multiplied to 6 that subtracted to 1. That would be 3 and 2. The 3 has to be negative because we end up with a negative a here. All right, I have a product of things equaling 0. One of them has to be 0, so either 3a equals 0 
where a minus 3 equals 0, or a plus 2 equals 0. This gives us a equals 0. This gives us a equals 3. And this gives us a equals negative 2. All right, so we would say the excluded values are Oh, notes. The excluded values are a, oh my goodness, I just sharpened all these, so maybe that's why they're breaking. A equals 0, A equals 3, and A equals negative 2. All right? Really not that difficult. We're just taking the denominator, we're setting it equal to 0, and we're factoring. All right, whatever solutions you get, those are the excluded values. Okay, next I would like you to look at page 89 in your workbook. Page 89. So this is on absolute value equations. So I feel like we need to have a little bit of a conversation here about absolute values uh, just in general. But if you remember from our conversation the other day, let me just write some of this stuff down. We said if we had absolute value of negative 3, it was positive 3. If we had absolute value of 3, it was positive 3. The absolute value indicated a distance that this number is away from 0. All right? So again, the negative tells us a direction. Um, and so what the absolute value is doing is it's stripping away the direction and it's just telling us the distance. All right, so when we have absolute value of negative 3, it's saying that it is 3 units away from the origin. It's just not telling you that it's 3 units to the left. All right, so again, if we have this at 0 and this at negative 3, that is 3 units away from the origin. doesn't matter that it's to the left, it's still 3 units away. Just like over here at positive 3, that's 3 units away. Right? So absolute value strips away that directional sign, which is the negative, and it just tells us the distance part. Right? So when we start looking at problems like this, this is saying that something right here has a distance of 42 away from the origin. Or, sorry, no, the origin, the zero on the number line. Again, there's only one letter in this, so we're solving these uh, on the number line, essentially. All right, so some number is 42 units away from zero, all right? So we know that this could either be over at positive 42 or it could be at negative 42. So what that's saying is that this thing inside 6m is either equal to 42 or 6m could have been negative 42. If I put positive 42 in here, whatever that is, when I take the absolute value of positive 42, I get 42. When I take the absolute value of negative 42, I also get 42. So 6m must have either been 42 or negative 42. So when we take the absolute value of it, we get 6m. All right, I'm going to solve both of these equations. I divide both sides by 6, and I get m equals 7. And on this side, right here, this equation, I divide both sides by 6, and I get m equals negative 7. And so the, the, those are the two spots, the two values, for which I could plug them in here, and I would end up getting an absolute value that equaled 42. And we can just check that and try. If I plug 7 in here, I get 6 times 7, which is 42. I take the absolute value of 42, and I get 42. Here, if I plug negative 7 in, I get 6 times negative 7 is negative 42. The absolute value of negative 42 is 42. Okay, the next one. Again, it's saying something, when I take its absolute value, gives me 3. All right. So this thing inside had to either be positive 3, so I could take the absolute value and get 3, or negative 3, so that I can take the absolute value and get 3. So again, I'm going to set up two equations. k minus 10 could have either been 3, or k 
k minus 10 could have been negative 3. Right, again, if I take the absolute value of 3, I get 3. If I take the absolute value of negative 3, I get 3. So I'm going to set up two equations to represent those two situations. Right, I add 10 to both sides, I get k equals 13. And I add 10 to both sides here, and I get k equals 7. All right, let's check them, because the first one we got two uh, values that had the same numerical value, just one was positive, one was negative. These are two different numbers, so let's see what the heck is going on that makes that happen. All right, so for this one we try 13. 13 minus 10 gives us 3, absolute value of 3 is 3, yeah, okay. And then this one we plug 7 in, 7 minus 10 gives us negative 3, okay, and then absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. All right, so those are the two solutions that we would get to this equation. All right, let's skip down to number 7. Both of these just had an absolute value on one side and a number on the other side, absolute value and a number. But in problem 7, <clears throat> what we have is, in addition to the absolute value here, we also have a number 7. Right, just is coincidental that that's the problem number. But when we have some number that's outside the absolute value, we have to move it to the other side because again, we're trying to figure out what this absolute value could be. All right, so I'm gonna first divide both sides by seven and I get absolute value of n is equal to eight. All right, this should remind you of that first problem that we did now where we just had absolute value equals a number like that. This one's even easier because this is just saying what number when I take the absolute value of it gives me 8. Well, that says that n has to either equal positive 8, because the absolute value of 8 is 8, or n has to be equal to negative 8, because the absolute value of negative 8 is 8. All right, and if we try them back in the original equation, 7 times the absolute value of 8, which is just 8, so 7 times 8, is that 56? Yes. All right, I try negative eight in here. Seven times the absolute value of negative eight. Absolute value of negative eight is positive eight. So seven times eight, is that 56? Yes. All right, those are our two solutions. All right, same thing here. <clears throat> now, you might be saying, Mrs. Taylor, you said absolute values can never be negative. That's true, but this is not just a plain old absolute value. We have some negative number multiplied by the absolute value equals a negative number, so don't panic just yet. Let's remove anything that's not the absolute value from the left side here, which is the negative three. So I'm gonna divide both sides by negative three. And when I do that, I end up with absolute value of P is equal to four. That's fine, all right? I can take the absolute value and get four. The only reason it looked wrong here uh, is because there was also some negative on the other side that was making this negative. So negative times something that's never negative, so it's either zero or positive, gives me a negative number. That is true, negative times positive is negative. All right, so now we've got absolute value of P equals four, just like the last problem now. Uh, we would say P equals positive four or p equals negative 4. All right, let's come down here. So, so far we've either had no steps that we've had to do to get the absolute value by itself, like problems 1 and 3. In problems 7 and 9, we had one thing we had to do to get the absolute value by itself. All right, in both cases it was divided, but in other cases, like 8, it will be multiply, all right? Or in other cases like this, it might be subtract, all right? But let's take a look at number 13. Um, so in this case, there's still one step, although our inner, inner step is going to require some other work. All right, so absolute value of a minus 5 divided by 8. I'm going to get the absolute value by itself by multiplying both sides by 8. When I do that, these 8s cancel out and I get absolute value of a minus 5 on the left, and on the right I get 40. Again, this thing that's inside here must either be 40 or negative 40 if I take its absolute value and I get 40. 
All right, so I'm going to say either a minus 5 is 40. What was inside could have been a 40, or what was inside a minus 5 could be negative 40. When I do that here, I get a equals 45. And when I do that here, I get a equals negative 35. And again, try them out. Just convince yourself that this is right. If I put a 45 in here, I get 45 minus 5 is 40. Absolute value of 40 is 40. 40 divided by 8 is 5. All right? This is the more interesting one. If I plug in negative 35, negative 35 minus 5 gives me a negative 40. Absolute value of negative 40 is 40. 40 divided by 8 is 5, and that's what I wanted. All right, how about you pause the video for just a second, and I want you to do number 15. Okay, so here's what I would do. Absolute value of 7m equals 70. I want to get the absolute value by itself. All right, so subtract 3 from both sides. And now if I get the absolute value of something equals 70, that something right here was either a 70 or it was a negative 70. Whoops, oh, I wrote negative 10, probably in anticipation of the answer. All right here it says that m equals, oh my goodness, m equals positive 10, and here it's saying m equals negative 10. All right. Okay, page 90. Oh no, yeah, it is page 90. That's as hard as these get. All right, there aren't any other problems like this. All right, so then let's take a look at page 90 and 91. page 90 first. All right, these do get a little bit harder, all right? And again, let's think back to what we had before. When we had 6n equals, I'm sorry, absolute value of 6n equals 18, um, we could just look at that as this thing had to either be 18 or it had to be negative 18. This is going to be complicated by this symbol right here, all right? And here's how I'm hoping uh, you can remember it. Um, again, this might sound silly, but if you remember when you were little, your mom, you know, you would be at the mall and your mom, you know, so you're less than, you're smaller, all right? So you're younger. Your mom would always say, stay with me, stay with me, hold my hand. I don't want you to go too far. You can at most be three steps away from me. 18 might be too many, but you can be at most three steps away from me. I want you to be close. I don't want you to get lost, all right? So what's happening here is we're saying that around this thing, we're trying to create a bubble that's less than or equal to 18, all right? I want you to stay in a contained spot when we do that, all right? So I'm gonna be looking for anything that makes this less than or equal to 18. So you can go out to 18 this far, you can go out to 18 this far, but don't go past that, all right? Um, so we're trying to keep a contained area. In just a minute, we're gonna look at one where it's in the opposite direction, but for these problems where it's less than, you're going to get a little window around uh, something that's going to keep it closed in. All right. So if I'm trying to get uh, no farther than 18, again, we could assume that this is positive in here. All right. So then 6n would literally have to be less than or equal to 18. All right. But if this were negative inside, I would say that, again, this could go as big as, I'm sorry, as small as negative 18. So when we take the absolute value, we would be less than 18. If we made this, let's say, negative 24, right? When I take the absolute value of it, it would be 24, which would not be less than 18. All right, so I'm trying to make sure that I don't go any less than negative 18 in here, and I don't go any bigger than 18 on this side. All right, I want to stay, so when I take the absolute value, 
it stays less than 18. So one thing could be if the inside were positive, then I would say 6n has to be less than or equal to 18. In the negative side, I would say that 6n has to be greater than or equal to negative 18. Whatever's inside had better be greater than or equal to negative 18 because if it goes to negative 19 or something less than that, the absolute value is going to be too big. It's not going to be less than or equal to 18. All right. So on the positive side, essentially what we're just doing is losing those inequal or the absolute value signs. But in the reverse direction, we're saying 6n has to be greater than or equal to the negative version of it. All right. So then let's solve both of these inequalities. 6n is less than or equal to 18 and 6 n is greater than or equal to negative 18. All right, I divide both sides by 6. I get n has to be less than or equal to 3. And this side, I'm going to divide both sides by 6. That's totally cool because this is a positive number. So I'm going to get n is greater than or equal to negative 3. All right, it might be helpful to have these reversed. I want all values of n that are greater than or equal to negative 3, but I don't want them to get higher than positive 3. All right, so for this, it's saying I want negative 3 and above, but don't get so far as you get beyond positive 3. And what that does is it gives us this interval in here, all right, that kind of bubble around your mom, which would be in the center here, you may not go more than three units away on either side. Sorry, I'm not sure why that just automatically shut off. Um, anyway, what I was saying here is essentially you're in a little bubble around this, um, and we just can't go greater than three units away on either side. So I need n to be less than or equal to three, but it also at the same time has to be greater than or equal to negative three. So we are in this little closed, compact window. All right. And again, if you try different values in here, like let's say we try 0, is the absolute value of 6 times 0 less than or equal to 18? Yeah, well, 6 times 0 is 0. Absolute value of 0 is 0 less than or equal to 18. Yep. Try negative 1. 6 times negative 1, that's negative 6. Absolute value of negative 6 is 6. Is 6 less than or equal to 18? Yes, it is. Okay, number two. Um, absolute value of p plus 4 is less than or equal to 8. Again, this is like you may not go any further away from me than 8 units. All right, so again, we're going to end up with a little compact bubble or just a, a finite, you know, little strip right here. Okay. So again, same thing before. If this is positive right here inside, then it's just saying that p plus 4 has to be less than or equal to 8. All right, the absolute values don't do anything at all to a positive number. So p plus 4 would just stay p plus 4, right? Um, if this were a negative number, again, think if we got this to negative 9 or negative 10, when we take the absolute value of it, it becomes positive. It's no longer less than 8, right? So we want to make sure that this does not go any lower than negative 8 or its absolute value will be bigger than 8, All right. So what we're saying here is p plus 4 has to be greater than or equal to negative 8, so that when we take the absolute value, it stays less than or equal to 8. All right, so what that looks like is p plus 4 is greater than or equal to 8. Nope, sorry, made a mistake there. p plus 4 is less than or equal to 8. And then the other one is p plus 4 simultaneously has to be greater than or equal to negative 8. All right, I solve this inequality, I get p has to be less than or equal to 4. And in this one, it is p has to be greater than or equal to negative 12. All right, this one was centered around 0, 0. That's just the way it worked out. It's not always going to be that way. All right, so simultaneously, I need p to be less than or equal to 4. So we start here, and we're going to shade this direction. At the same time, p has to be greater than or equal to negative 12. 
All right, so we have to make sure that we stay within this spot right here, less than or equal to four and greater than or equal to negative 12. And again, you can try different values in there. Let's say we try negative 10, negative 10 plus four is negative six. Absolute value of negative six is six, and that is less than eight. But if we try, let's say negative 14, something which we believe to be outside of this window right here. If I try negative 14, negative 14 plus four is negative 10. Absolute value of negative 10 is not less than negative eight. All right, again, so we're bounded above by things that make it um, greater than positive eight, and we're bounded below by things that make it less than negative eight. Okay, let's try number five. And again, the two that we did right here, they were less than or equal to. Again, the idea is when you're little and your mom is taking you to the mall or out to the park or something, don't go too far away from me. I want you to stay. So we're gonna end up with like just a little spot around you that you can move. But now that you are teenagers and your mom gets sick and tired of your attitude sometime, she is like, do not come anywhere near me. I don't wanna hear your complaining. Um, and so when we've got greater than or equal to, what this is saying is stay away from me. Do not come within, you know, 10 feet of me where we're going to get into an argument, right? And so what we're going to find when we do these is that there's going to be a spot in here where we are not allowed to go, that we must stay away from it on both sides. All right, so let's take a look at this. There's something outside the absolute value. If I'm trying to get the absolute value by itself, I want to move this. So this is saying absolute value of X is greater than or equal to six, All right? So my distance must be greater than or equal to six. It might be my distance is in the negative direction or it might be in the positive direction, but I must stay at least six units away. All right, so here, if this were positive, the absolute value symbols do nothing to it. We would just get x is greater than or equal to six. All right, but over here, if I wanna stay six units away, I have to be less than, I have to be down here way in the negatives. So x must be less than or equal to negative six. All right, there's not much here. I didn't even need to write them over here. x is greater than or equal to six or x is less than or equal to negative six, there's no solving to do, they're already ready to go. So in this one, I would say x has to be greater than or equal to six. All right, and here x has to be less than or equal to negative six. All right, do not come near me. All right, I'm saying get away. So it's gonna extend infinitely far to the right and infinitely far to the left. Uh, and this is the bubble around which your mother does not want you to enter, all right? Just stay away from there. Again, let's try values. Let's try, let's try 10. Is absolute value of 10 plus five greater than 11? Yeah, absolute value of 10 is 10 plus five is 15. Yes, that's greater than 11. Down here, let's try negative eight. Absolute value of negative eight, that would give me positive eight. Positive eight plus five gives me 12. Yes, that works. All right, so let's just kind of make a little note up here that if we have um, less than, or we have less than or equal to, all right, so some absolute value, let me put that a little bit closer. Absolute value of some number is less than some other number, or if we have absolute value of something is less than or equal to some number, all right, what that's gonna look like is you're gonna end up with some window in here, all right, that's shaded in. It might be hollow dots on the end, it might be solid dots, but I just want you to remember that it's an enclosed little space. If it is absolute value of something is greater than some number or absolute value of something is greater than or equal to some number, we're going to end up with our number line and we're gonna shade out to the left and we're gonna shade out to the right, but we're gonna have an empty space in here which you may not enter, All right? So just remember those that less than, 
again when you were little you had to be in an enclosed space close to your mom and then here outside away okay let's take a look at page 91 there are three problems I want to look at here one is just normal and then two are special so let's look at problem uh, I think I want to do 21 first hold on let me find it yeah let's do 21 first all right so for problem 21 again I want to get this absolute value by itself so I'm going to move these things that are outside the absolute value over to the other side so this is going to become 2 times the absolute value of 10b plus 7 is greater than 74 and then I'm going to divide both sides by 2 so I get absolute value value of 10b plus 7 is greater than what's that 37 yeah okay again that greater than symbol means we're heading out that direction so that says that I either want 10b plus 7 to be greater than 37 to be way out here or I want it to be less than negative 37 all right so or 10b plus 7 has to be less than negative 37 all right I subtract 7 I get 10b is greater than 30 and then b is greater than 3 and in this side I subtract 7 I get 10b is less than negative 44 and b is less than negative 4.4 usually you'll find that happens it's very rare that if you're doing a multi-step thing here that you get both of them to work out to be integer values usually one is and the other's not all right so b has to be greater than three again there's our strict inequality so hollow dot shade above here and then 4.4 negative 4.4 i'm going to put a hollow dot right there and then we'll shade to the left okay 19 and 25 are unusual that's why I want to look at them all right again we don't know that I'm just telling you that so I'm going to move this over to the other side um, so I add 10 to both sides I get 9 times the absolute value of r minus 2 is less than negative 63 then I divide both sides by um, 9 and I get absolute value of r minus 2 is less than negative 7. And again, if you're not paying attention, maybe you're going to say, okay, um, I know this is a less than, so it's a little bubble, and then I've got r minus 2, so I want r minus 2 to be less than negative 7, and r minus 2 to be greater than positive 7. But if you're paying attention, you would say, wait a minute, I know an absolute value by itself like this can never be negative all right so if it can never be negative how can it be less than some negative number all right this is just not possible all right I can't get this to work out uh, so this would be no solution all right an absolute value cannot be less than a negative number right so again absolute value of something is never less than or less than or equal to a negative number all right so no solution we would not shade anything on here and then finally the last one let's take a look at this um, again I'm going to move these things over so I'm going to subtract three from both sides I'm going to end up with four times the absolute value of three x plus seven has to be greater than or equal to negative 92. I divide both sides by 4. I get absolute value of 3x plus 7 is greater than or equal to, that is negative uh, 23. All right, again, that negative sign should be making your spidey senses go crazy right now. All right. But it's different from this. Here I was saying an absolute value is less than a negative number. Not possible. Absolute values are always zero or positive. 
right? So how can a zero or positive be less than a negative? It can't be. But here, again, this is always going to be zero or positive. Can that be greater than a negative number? Uh, yeah, all the time. Zero or positive is always greater than a negative. So any x value that I put in here is going to get me something greater than or equal to negative 23. All right, so if I put negative 83 in here, I'm not going to pick 83. That's too big for me to multiply in my head. Let's say negative 20. 3 times negative 20 is negative 60. Negative 60 plus 7 is negative 53. Absolute value of negative 53 is positive 53. Is that greater than a negative number? Yes, it is. Right? This will always be positive or zero, which is always greater than a negative number. All right, so we would shade everything in. Every x value is going to make this true. And we would say all real numbers. All right, I believe that there are two others on this page. No, I'm wrong. Just one other one on the page that's like one of these two. That's like either 19 or 25. Okay, uh, that's it. You're just going to practice the problems that I've assigned to you. Um, and... Hopefully I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye.